Have to flip it around. Up. See, I'm a tech guy too. I was just putting it upside down. It worked last week. That's all I have to say. So y'all were here to see that too. So. Oh, well, now it's not. So. <laughs> All right, so we started our class last week on peacemaking. Um, it comes from Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And as you guys consider what conflict was, for our class, the definition we're going to use is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at what the sources or the causes of conflict are. And we got into the five Gs. So the foundational G is the gospel of Christ. When we understand the message of the gospel, when we understand what God has called us to do, uh, we are going to be able to live out this peacemaking mentality. So the second G is glorify God. And that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, next week, we're going to get into get the log and then so on and so forth. So uh, I'll also ask you guys to consider the slippery slope. So on the left-hand side, we have escape responses. These are peace-faking responses. These are things that people uh, often accept that they think will bring peace when, in fact, they don't. Uh, is this recording? Did you hit record? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, if in, uh, so they, we think they bring peace, and in some ways, they might bring temporary peace, but ultimately, it's not bringing true uh, peace. Then we have the uh, attack. Um, responses or the peace breaking responses. Uh, these are people uh, not different to myself that enjoy uh, conflict and see it as something to win, something that we can use to to conquer others and impact our will. So these are the sides we're trying to avoid. And uh, think about the slippery slope as like a mossy rock or standing on top of a piece of ice. Uh, the more you go to the left or to the right, uh, the harder it's going to be to stay on top. So we want to stay in these peacemaking responses. And each one of these uh, are a biblical approach to peacemaking. So uh, as we go through the class, we're going to get into that. But hopefully this was helpful to you. Hopefully uh, you put this uh, somewhere in your house if you're able to see it. Uh, hopefully you've been able to just at least be conscious of how much conflict uh, there is in your life, and you look to this as a way to resolve conflict. But we're getting into the first G this morning, um, glorify God. So conflict provides an opportunity to glorify God. That's kind of like one of the themes that I want you to pick up for this class. Conflict provides an opportunity to glorify God. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or the church of God, just as I also, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So what is Paul's secret uh, that he reveals here is necessary to glorify God in a conflict? Yeah. Okay, so that would fall in line with like Philippians 2, right? Uh, what did Jesus do to be a peacemaker? He humbled himself. Uh, he didn't consider his own needs. He left the Father to come and be a peacemaker uh, for us. And that's what we're doing as well. We are trying to imitate uh, Jesus Christ. And that's why the G is the foundational G for being the gospel of Christ. So living at peace, what, what is the idea of peace really look like? And this is uh, the way I'm going to present it for us this morning. Peace is really, I want you to think about it in three dimensions. You have peace with God, peace with uh, yourself, and peace with others. So peace with God, peace with yourself, and peace with others. If you don't have peace with God, it's going to be really difficult to fulfill the other two. Uh, so when we think about peace, I think a lot of times uh, we think of uh, not having anxiety or, or maybe not having conflict. And there's certainly some truth to that. Uh, but I want to focus this morning on what we're really striving after. And that's why the first one, peace with God, is so important. 
For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth, earth or things in heaven. Uh, this is the foundational concept of peace. So uh, in your homework, look at uh, your homework. And I thought I had a copy of the homework up here. Um, okay. So uh, I ask you guys to read Romans 12, uh, 18. I ask you guys to define peace. So uh, what are some uh, ideas that you wrote down? What is peace? Or okay, the absence of strife or tension, maybe the absence of conflict. Kind of cheated in these context. Like the, verse, the verse before. And okay. Honorable okay. Uh, so you're you're serving others. You're looking to honor others and not yourself. Uh, other ideas of what is peace? Yeah. Choosing love over being right. Okay, choosing love over being right. Uh, so that's difficult for someone that, again, likes conflict. Uh, I want to be right. I like to be right. And I want to be justified, uh, especially if I'm right. Uh, so choosing love, uh, choosing to think of others as more important than yourself. That's the Philippians 2 um, passage. Other ideas? Yeah. I like the way that Peter says that when he talks about Jesus, though he was reviled, he did not reviled and return and suffered. He did not threaten, but committing himself. To him who judges them. I think that's one of the keys is whether it was fair or not, nice or not, Jesus committed himself to so first Peter uh says that in first Peter two, and at, at the end he's trying to make this point, and uh we, we had mentioned this already, so it should sound repetitive. Jesus has the right to judge and he has the power to judge. Um, but he didn't, and he entrusted himself to God. We who have no power. And we who truthfully have no right to judge, and we love to judge, and we love to not entrust ourselves to a faithful creator. Uh, later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, when he's writing about uh, the eldership, he is in inviting us to trust ourselves to a faithful creator. It's the same kind of language. Um, so great observation. So uh, as we get into the second question, how does the Bible talk about God and peace? How does the Bible talk about God and peace? Okay, Jesus described as the Prince of Peace. Uh, other ideas. How does the, the Bible talk about God and peace? Okay, so it, it is beyond understanding. So why do I even have to try then? If it's beyond comprehension, why should I try to understand peace? Uh, absolutely I, I have to make some sort of effort to to try and understand what is the peace that surpasses all understanding what is the peace that i can uh, ascertain and, and grab a hold of maybe i don't understand it in its fullest concept but i can understand something now uh these are ideas that we're uh, chelsea and i are practicing with our kids so our kids uh we, we've been focusing a lot on deception with our kids uh we want them to try and have a grasp of deception and deception is not necessarily lying, but you have to ask yourself, why am I trying to deceive? Uh, and they have a very limited grasp of what deception is, uh, but they can continue to grow and pursue uh, this idea of what it means to be truthful and honest in all aspects of life. So uh, in a similar way, that's how we can uh, understand peace. Maybe right now, all you can think about is peace with God, and that, that's fine. You have a limited understanding. Uh, now push yourself to understanding what it means to have inner peace uh, because you have peace with God and then push yourself even further to pursue peace and to create peace in a world that is full of conflict. Uh, I, I want to move on to number three. So uh, I just want to show you guys um, some of the notes that, that I put together. So this, this blew my mind. Uh, I just did a Bible hub search on peace uh, and I gave you guys some of the verses, but like 
all these are just verses on peace that that emphasize peace and mention peace. Uh, it, it is quite overwhelming, and, and I understand that. So I listed a couple of verses, uh, one off, and I asked you guys to read the verses and summarize. Uh, what do verses? Uh, what do those verses teach about peace? Peace is what? Peace is what? Okay, it is a blessing that we receive. Um, what else? What else is peace? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if we're going to summarize peace, uh, I think a good way to think about what peace looks like. Uh, peace is a blessing from God. Uh, peace is a blessing from God. And peace can also be referred to as unity. Uh, and this is where we start getting into, I think, a lot of the practicalities of peacemaking and what it means to, to be at peace with others. So uh, do you know anyone who claims to have peace with God, but doesn't have peace with others? And do, I, do any of us know people like that? Okay, yes. <laughs> Do you guys know people that claim to have peace with God that, that are professed Christians, but they are like some of the biggest problem starters, uh, even within the church? Yeah? All right. Well, I started to get worried that I was just thinking about everybody else. And so, um, yeah, we know people like that. Uh, we know people that uh, claim to have peace with God, and yet you look at their life, they have no peace. They don't have peace in their marriage. They don't have peace in their families. They don't have peace among the church brethren. They don't have uh, inner peace. And so as you begin to look at that, what do you begin to think? What would be the natural conclusion? Sorry? Yeah, do they really have peace with God? Because if I have peace with God, shouldn't some of that be, be seeping into my life? Like, if I claim to be something, shouldn't you see some kind of fruit in my life? Uh, and this is where I really struggle <clears throat> with this concept of peace because it, it is so much a reality check. And that's why the second G, get the log out of your own eye, is so important. I think it's very easy to look at others and to say, you are being a peace breaker. You are not being a peacemaker. And yet, wh what am I doing to uh, pursue peace? And that's the other idea I like in Hebrews 12 pursue, like attain it, try and chase down peace with all men. So going back to first Peter, first Peter, uh, love the way he describes it at the end of chapter one, uh, right about like, I think it's like verse it's between verses 20 and 22 of chapter one. He says, you have been purified for a sincere love of the brethren. Therefore, fervently love one another from the heart. You were saved you were saved, you were purified, you were cleansed, not just from your sins, and, and that's awesome, but you weren't just cleansed and saved from that. You were purified and saved so that you could have a sincere love for the brethren. When's the last time that you thought about that? That Jesus died so that you could sincerely love the brethren. And, and that's what that looks like. Um, so I don't know who the most recent person here baptized was. I don't know. Uh, so... Uh, Kaya, Kaya, yeah. I, I remember your baptism at least. So if someone else beats her, like raise your hand now. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so Kaya, when, when you were baptized, what did you think about the university group? So um, that was like December, right? No. November? I think it's October. Okay, whatever. I was <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what did you think about the, the brethren at university at the moment you were baptized? I don't know. It felt like both. Right? These are the greatest people on the face of the earth. Yeah. No one can do any wrong, right? So, so now you've been a, a Christian for a little bit, right? Uh, you, and you don't need to answer. You still have the same love for the brethren. Like, and, and think about your own conversion. Think about when you first started attending university. Like, I'm sure you felt the same way. These are the greatest people on the face of the earth. Uh, yesterday, we had a study uh, with uh, this couple. And... The lady uh, mentioned that. She was like, I'm so thankful that we found university. I love hearing that, but I'm also like, man, I was very pointed to tell her, look, that's great. 
but we will disappoint you. Like, I will disappoint you. And you know what happens? You at one point saw these brethren as just perfect. Like they could do no wrong. But then someone hurt you. And someone caused you pain. Someone betrayed you. Someone lied to you. Someone didn't consider your feelings. And so now you have a sincere love for most of the brethren. And now you love the brethren, but you don't fervently love the brethren. And now you have a sincere love for most of the brethren. You, you kind of love the brethren, but it's not from a pure heart or from the deepest profound level that you could love them. And that's why pursuing peace is important. Unity is going to be our tool to showing people the gospel. Think about all the efforts that, that we go through to show people the gospel. So we currently are uh, utilizing money to buy Google advertisements. Uh, is, that, is that a good effort? I, I think so. Like, uh, we use our money to buy Bibles so that people can just have the Bible. If they need. Is that a good effort? I'm, I'm starting to get really worried here. <laughs> like, yeah, you guys think so? All right. Uh, so we use money to buy invitations to hand out to people. Uh, I use money to buy pins. Uh, and I try to find all these different ways to think about ways that we can reach out and evangelize people. And I think most of us would say, man, that's a great thing. Like, we should keep doing that. We should do more of that. Uh, we dedicate money to having websites where people can go and to sign up for studies. All that's tremendous. You know, the greatest tool we have, being at peace with others, being at peace with others is the greatest tool that we have to sharing the gospel with other people. Uh, so questions that come, or question or comments as far as peace with others. Yeah, Mike. Peace isn't just a blessing you get from God. It's also a blessing you give to others. Amen. Amen. I do that with my kids, and they're arguing. I have a choice of either coming in, guns and blazing, screaming and yelling, at them, or I can sit down and provide peace with them. You know, so if all of us can approach conflict with what are, what am I bringing to the table? Am I bringing peace to it? So it's yeah. a blessing. Yeah, but you can only give it to them if you really have God's presence in your life, right? Uh, I I think that's tremendous. Yeah, Amen. Um, yeah, Steve. Uh, and I went to a bigger congregation and hey, no, the man who baptized me came to me and said, Brethren of disappointment, let's be talking. Yeah. So I went to my first business meeting and I left in tears and he came up behind me and said, Put your trust and faith in God. Amen. So Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, so in between, and I, I was d debating on this and I decided not to do it. Uh, but I would encourage y'all to like in between this, these lessons of glorifying God and get the log out of your own eye. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of trust that's involved in that. And unfortunately, we don't have time to, to do a class, a whole class on trust. But but that's the conclusion. You have to trust God. If you trust God with your soul, everything will be all right. Hermano, puedes cerrar la puerta, por favor? Gracias. Um, if you trust God with all your soul, then then you're going to be okay with not pursuing your own peace uh, because God's got that. You don't have to go and vindicate yourself and be right because you trust that God will take care of these things. Uh, so trust is, is, again, another key component to glorifying God and then getting the law out of your own eye. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah, sure. I think that this is kind of countercultural where we're at today. Yeah. Uh, today. Someone, you have to tell them. Yeah. Um, you just you know, you think about what happens when I, and that's how I'm starting the conversation, or that's how I'm reinforcing any sort of relationship that we may or may not have, is by telling you why I think you're wrong. You know, you're 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 creating conflict. And yeah. You're creating a lot of conflict out there because we always feel that it's necessary to let people know why they're wrong. Yeah. Why I think what I think and why I think is right. We just we don't see that in Jesus' life at that, at that magnitude. Yeah. Right? He spent a lot of time with people who he thought was wrong. Yeah. Right? And that's not to say there was no conflict in his life. Yeah. But he clearly had a purpose Amen. for 
what it is that he was doing, and it wasn't to alienate. Amen. Um, the, my wife has been one of the greatest uh, tools I've had uh, to grow in, in my maturity and uh, Christ-like attitude. Um, it was, I mean, she'd probably been saying this for years, but I didn't hear it until like, you know, like a month ago. So, um, but, but one of the things she, she's had to point out to me in, in peace is like, I, I don't necessarily have to voice my opinion of why I think someone is wrong. Uh, but I love trying to push people to see like, why do you really believe that? And so I like to be devil's advocate. Like I like to, to push people's buttons to see like, do you really believe that? Like, or are you just saying that because that's what you think? And, uh, you know, this was through a process that was pointed out to me that like, I love putting people in the hot seat. And, and I, I thought about, uh, as you were speaking, like, I think part of my issue with uh, pursuing peace is there's just a wealth of information out there. And because there is so much information available to us, uh, I want people to have a stance. I want people to uh, know why they believe what they believe. And so my lack of peace comes ultimately because I want to be God and I want to humble people. Like, you don't know why you believe uh, that, I don't know, Apple is the best product. Well, like, you're an idiot, and, and I'm going to humble you. I'm going to make sure that you know that, that I'm superior to you. And what I'm really doing is putting myself in the position of God. And, and for a short time, that was good. Uh, that's why I don't have peace in my life. Just a thought, too, is, you know, that Roman verse right there says it's possible. Which tells me that there may be an opportunity or a time where it won't be peace. Yeah. Yeah. But I also have to look at it so far as it depends on you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. How hard am I going to strive to make sure, even though we know there's not going to be time where there will be a peace of Yeah. But I can't look at it top out saying, well, you know what? I know there's not going to be peace here. Amen. So that, we, we, let's, talk, let's talk about it uh, that, because you brought it up. So, how hard do you strive to create peace? Because the idea is that I pursue it with everything I have. The language there, uh, if you just do an etymology uh, on that, is the idea of a gladiator fighting to stay alive. How hard does a gladiator fight to stay alive? How hard does a soldier fight to stay alive? Are they pretty passive? Are they like, well, I try to kill you know, this, this bear, this lion, this person attacking me once, and you know, that was good enough. I'm asking, like someone, someone give me something, please. Sorry? Okay, yeah. Yeah, why? Why do you have to be so aggressive when you're in the arena? Yeah, because if you're not, like, man, you're not making it out of their alive. Do you pursue peace in that way? Do you give it everything you have? Or is it like, man, you know what? Like, I try to talk to, uh, try to talk to you once. I got texted you. You text me back. Okay. Uh, and I, I said hi to you at the building. You should have known that that was me trying to make peace with you. And, and you didn't come up. And you know what? Like, oh, well, I tried. I gave it everything I had. Did you? Like, did you strive like a gladiator to stay alive and pursue peace? Yeah. You're talking about like in a, in a gladiator scenario, right? They're motivated because they value their life. There's something at stake. Amen. Of yeah. A lot of value. And so it really comes down to the relationship that's, you know, in the conflict. Is that a value? Because growing up, there was a lot of times where friends would fall apart. Um, and you could tell who came back together because they valued that friendship. Yeah. If you don't value the relationship you have with somebody else, there's no motivation. Amen. Yeah. Um, or for something. Whereas we see some friend like, man, we've been friends for 10 years. I'm not going to let this conflict fall apart. Uh, so come on, you know, we can walk through this. That's yeah. a very different outcome than somebody that just had a very loose relationship with somebody else. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, there's just gone with the wind and I can move on. Absolutely. Uh, and, and what's at stake here, even greater than our relationships, which is very important, is the gospel of God. Like when I don't give everything to pursue peace with someone that I'm in conflict with, whether they be a brother or a sister in Christ or not, the gospel is at stake. And I have opportunity to either glorify God or to glorify something else. Uh, we're going to get into some of these nuances. But, but the other thing that I wanted to comment on what Jared said, uh, 
where sometimes things have to be overlooked. Uh, and most of the time, we need to do a better job of just overlooking the minor offenses. Now, sometimes you can't do that. Uh, sometimes you have to go up on the peacemaking uh, ladder, so to speak, and get into some other details. And we'll get into that as we get into the class. But the idea here, pursue peace, give it everything you have. Uh, then the other idea of peace, after peace with God, peace with others, is peace within ourselves or inner peace. And the work of righteousness will be peace and the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. If only I paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. So what we are told is that inner peace is a byproduct of having peace with God. Uh, and we will never have complete peace if all we have in our lives are broken relationships. Uh, so if you want to have that inner peace, that shalom, the, the calm and quietness, you first have to look at your relationship with God. Then you look at your relationship with others. And if your relationship with God is where it ought to be, you're going to have peace. If your relationship relationship with others is where it ought to be. You're going to have peace. Uh, but again, the question that I want to ask is, why should I pursue peace with others? Uh, because maybe you you and I both agree we have peace with God uh, because he's reconciled us um, through Christ Jesus. We have grace, mercy, forgiveness. But why should I pursue peace with others? And to that, we're going to look at Jesus's words. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The greatest advertisement we can give to the world is our own relationships. It's not billboards. It's not the Bible handouts. It, it's not anything besides the relationship and the commitment that I have uh, to my brethren here. People should find something that they can't in here that they can't find anywhere else in the world. And I'm trying to limit it to uh, university because that's where I'm a member of. Uh, now, obviously, this is true of uh, Christianity across the board, churches across the board, but let's focus it here at university. Do we have peace at university? This is the difficulty with uh, being a church as large as we are. So uh, when we're in a small church, so Luke and I, uh, uh, we worshiped together for, for many years out in California. Uh, we had roughly like 200 people. Um, even within a congregation that size, like you still kind of got to pursue peace with everybody, right? Because like, you know, we only had like so much space in the building. <laughs> um, and then during COVID, we had Tent City. So maybe you could sit on like the right side of the building and not see the left side of the building. Uh, I say building, like we were in the parking lot, but you know, whatever. Uh, but like, inevitably you would run into each other. So like in a congregation that's small, uh, and I know, know that's not, I know you guys have smaller congregations uh, than the you know, 200, like some of 50, 20, and, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, you have to make peace. I think it's difficult uh, in a congregation this size to pursue peace with others uh, because it's easy to avoid each other, right? Like, it's easy if I don't want to see you, then I don't have to see you. If I don't want to talk to you, like I see you, you know, across the building uh, in what I now refer to as like the visitor section, uh, because it's where all the visitors uh, sit. You know, if you're facing uh, the stage, the right side of the building, like I'll just sit over there and I don't have to talk to the left side people. Um, and it's really easy to get in and out of. So we need to make sure that we are showing people that we really have peace with God through our re relationships with one another. Um, this is so fundamental and so important because people can look at our lives and they can say, I see a commitment here that I don't see anywhere else. Uh, and to just make this point a little bit more emphatic, let's look at this prayer that Jesus prayed. Uh, so I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for all those who believe in me through their word that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly united so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. So this is right before Jesus dies. All right. These are like some of the last words that we get of Jesus. And this is a prayer that he prays for his disciples. What does he repeat three times? What's the, the idea or the theme behind this prayer? Moments before he's going to die. Yeah. 
unity, oneness. He says it three times in this short paragraph. God, I want them to be one. Unite them. Prove to the world that I came through their love and their peace and their devotion and their rec reconciliation. So when people look at the church and they look at university and they see divorce and they see church splits and they see conflicts and they see lawsuits and they say, and they see hypocrisy. What do they say? Oh, you're Christians. And your, your message of the gospel is, is peace, love and unity and forgiveness and mercy and grace and reconciliation. Why would I waste my time with that? You guys are no different than anybody else. You're just as bad as the friends I can find in the world. And what does that do to the gospel? It just builds a massive wall. But when they see the opposite happening, when they see us confessing our sins to one another, when they see humility, and, and this is another point we're going to get to uh, later on in the class, but like, I think we're really good about saying we're sinners. And I think we're really good about that. I think it's easy to say, yeah, we're all sinners. You know what brings real peace? When I am very specific about my sin to everyone. Uh, when I tell, you know, Brett, when I was uh, playing sports with you, I was being very prideful. I was being very arrogant. I was not displaying a Christ-like attitude. Like, that's something you don't see even amongst churches. We need to do a better job of that. Um, but when you see that, people are drawn to that. And people will say, you know, I've never done that in my marriage. Never showed that kind of humility in my job. And they start to get curious. Why? Yeah, that, that's relatable. Like that I can relate to not the facade that we, we often put up. So Jesus will go on to say that reconciliation and peace is even more important than worship. Like, don't even think about worshiping God if you know your brother has something against you, whether he should or shouldn't. If they have something against you, go and be reconciled. Make every reasonable effort to go and be reconciled. Make a real effort at that. And then come and worship. We can't control what the other person does. But I need to know that I've made every effort. So they may harden their hearts and they may reject me, but I need to know that I've done everything. So this is the example I have. Uh, like what if tomorrow, uh, like Michael Schmidt, you know, I know he's not here right now, but he was like, hey, I had, you know, good reason to leave y'all uh, and go to Texas. Uh, I was working on, on these uh, like lie detector things and because I'm so smart, I'm such a great engineer with the software. He would never say that, but I can say that about him. Uh, I was able to like recalibrate uh, the metal detectors to just be like conflict detectors. And uh, I'm gonna send y'all the prototypes. We're gonna put them out in front of uh, the university uh, church building. So when everyone comes in, we're just gonna know if they have conflict. <laughs> That sounds great, right? <laughs> like, I can only imagine, like, I would be going through the back door all the time. <laughs> uh, so, like, what if, what if we had conflict detectors uh, at university? How, how good would we feel about coming to worship God? Would we be nervous or hesitant to walk in? The reality is we do have a conflict detector here the Holy Spirit. He knows what condition our heart is in. How often do we drive to church and we are arguing with someone on the way? We pull into the parking lot, we put a smile on our face, and then we try and worship God. Or we try to teach a class on peacemaking. That didn't happen this morning, thankfully, <laughs> but it will. Jesus has told us how our worship ought to take place. And he teaches us that we need to be a reconciled body. If we try and change those rules, if we try to come in with conflict and then worship God, we're not going to get the worship that God intended for us to have. We can come, we can sing, we can pray, we can listen, we can learn. 
but it'll just be tasting a fraction of what God wants to give us. Uh, more importantly, we're giving God something that he doesn't desire. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Be humble, gentle, loving this is the first evidence of showing others that we understand that the gospel, that our church isn't the building, it's not the growth rate. It, it is so much more than, than what we often just present to people. And we have to strive to keep the unity of the peace. So that means resolving conflicts with your elders. Uh, that means resolving conflicts with your brothers and sisters, with your spouse, with your children. And, and you make every effort to do this, like we said, like a gladiator. Um, so this was an interesting uh, study that I did this week too, uh, or I guess last week. Um, did you know that every single New Testament epistle has something about peace uh, within it? That God, in writing to all these churches, said something about peacemaking in every single epistle. I find that interesting for this you know, simple reason. Maybe you were already aware of that. God knew that when people came together and called themselves a church, there would be conflict. And maybe that's why every single one has something on peacemaking, because God knew that there would be conflict. Uh, but God has given us a very high standard. He has told us that conflict provides an opportunity to glorify him. And he has told us that the secret to live in a way to glorify him is Jesus Christ. Like, that's the secret. Uh, so that's the, the summation of the class uh, that I've had so far. Questions, comments? Yeah. I mean, the word reconciliation always affects me. And like, that's a word that I think about pretty deeply, actually. Because um, I feel like in our minds, we're like, oh, yeah, I'll forgive, but I'm not going to forget what happened. Yeah. And reconciliation is not that. Because if that's reconciliation that Jesus talks about, then it's not forgiving my sins. Yeah. That he told me that he would forgive. Yeah. And so in my mind, that is something that just affects me when I'm trying to move on relationships. That it has to be restored to the version that it was before the. the yeah. Whatever happened, yeah, the conflict. Otherwise, that's not. Yeah, amen. Uh, the idea is uh, not because I think we as humans are horrible about forgetting, uh, but it's also this idea that I'm not going to throw them in your face or uh, press them against you or hold you accountable to those that that they're let go. So maybe I still have the memory of the the hurt that you caused me, but I'm not throwing it in your face and and. Uh, the, the idea of forgive and forget is not a Bible idea. It's not a biblical idea. Uh, it's a human idea uh, when, in fact, God doesn't just forget our sins. I mean, you're not, God, forgive me for my sins. And God's not like, oh, what sin? I have no idea. You sin? Oh, uh, no, he doesn't hold us accountable for that. Uh, it's been forgiven. Um, so, we'll, we'll close with this. And I think it's John, 1 John 4, says that God, yeah. As he gets older, he seems to be more safe and direct and drawn yeah. the line. He says, you don't love your brother who you see. You can't love God. Who you can't see. Yeah. Amen. I think that's a line we don't like to see. John. Yeah. No. So John says, you know, this is it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so some of the homework is going to get real personal. That's for you. Uh, we don't you don't have to share the personal things, the homework in class ever, unless you want to. Uh, but be honest on your homework. Um, I try to put questions on there that you can be honest uh, with. But next week, Lord willing, we'll get into uh, get the log out of your own eye, which is, I would say, one of the most important classes that we'll have. So uh, be prepared for that. You guys are dismissed. Thank you.